everyone. Welcome to session four. We are so glad that you have continued to join us for our last session. The Lord has been doing a lot and speaking a lot through Rebecca. And um, we're going to praise the Lord this morning. Thank you. God, there is nothing better than you. Lord, we give you praise. Thank you for working in and through us this weekend. In your name, amen. Amen.
My name is Rebecca Grieben, and you are in the final session of Courageous, the online women's retreat brought to you by River City Church here in New Braunfels, Texas. We're wrapping up our story of Esther, the amazing and interesting woman that we've been following for the last three sessions. And about now, we need to figure out where this story ends. We know that when we left our heroine in the previous session, she had thrown herself at the king's feet, begging for his mercy for the Jewish people. And chapter eight is gonna start bringing us home in this circumstance. So Mordecai comes into the presence of the king. Esther has told the king that he's related to her and told him about the plight of her people. And in an ironic twist, the king gives Mordecai his signet ring. Haman no longer needs it. Remember, he's been hung on the gallows that were constructed. And Mordecai now rises to a position that's considered second only to the king. Once Esther regains his attention and reminds him of the plight of her people, he gives them permission to write another decree in his name. He doesn't want to be bothered with writing it, as usual, but that's okay because he's given them permission to do it themselves. They can't revoke the previous edict. They can't reverse what he said before, because remember, once a Persian king has written law, you can't, you can't cancel it out. However, they can disarm it. The new decree that is written grants the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children. So they do. In the first verse of chapter 9 in Esther, we're told that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. In the end, they killed over 800 men, plus Haman's 10 sons in Susa alone. There were additional casualties in the rest of the king's provinces, upwards of 75,000 men. In other words, they won. God's people were saved. God's plan was executed quite thoroughly and dramatically, I would say. Esther found and fulfilled her purpose, rising above circumstances and limitations that initially seemed insurmountable, especially to her. She learned and led her people into an incredible lesson within their victory. And it's got some lessons for us as well. The first lesson I think that we learn from Esther's journey is that life is as precious as it is unfair. Acknowledging both of these truths helps the bitter with the sweet. We aren't promised fair. We're promised meaningful, blessed, hope-filled, purposeful, God-ordained, and many other descriptors, but not fair. Along the way, we hopefully find joy, peace, community, fun, adventure, and calling. But fair, not a factor. It never has been, and expecting it to be robs us of the amazingness that is our lives. The second lesson that we learn is that seasons don't last. None of them. Thank goodness sometimes, right? Change is as irrevocable as it is inevitable. And when I let this scare or intimidate me, I miss out on new blessings and opportunities. When I cling to how it's always been at the expense of how it could be, I minimize where God is taking me or those around me. And the thing about this is just like most change, it's not always fun. I can't always see the finish line. And even when I do, a lot of times I'm not actually on track with the end point anyway. I'm often shocked at how far off I've gotten. I've learned that seasons of crippling insecurity, heartbreak, or disappointment often preclude our times of greatest joy and growth. And they serve to give us empathy for others, as well as the ability to recognize the struggle in them. They stretch us in ways we've never wanted and force us to view things through a lens of increased patience and open-mindedness. We have to learn to enjoy the good times and power through the bad ones and get ready because you never actually know what's coming around the corner. The third lesson I think we learn from this journey is look up and find him. And this lesson is the key to it all, I believe. 
When I look around, letting the whispers of insecurity and imaginary measuring sticks of comparison rule my thoughts, I generally find myself in a state of restless dissatisfaction that I can't get out of. And it's easy to do, especially now in this age of media bombardment and selective oversharing. We can become overly nostalgic about stages we've passed through. It's easy to grow envious of someone else's freedom or success or ability to chase dreams that we think we want, but we can't have because we're drowning in our to-do lists or our busy schedules or the demands of those around us, or we don't have the same opportunities that those people. We can resent anything that gets in the way of what we feel like we should be doing. We can let fear rule the day and then turn into anger at the state of the world or the conflicting opinions of others. The only way out of this vicious cycle is to look up, listen well, and trust that God has us exactly where he wants us. He knows the desires of my heart, of all of our hearts. He is walking through every stage in our lives, even the dark ones. He hears our every cry of triumph, or of pain, and he loves us through every moment. The final lesson I think that we learned here is keep your eye on the prize. Nothing, ma- nothing we do matters unless all we do points to God. That, my friends, is the unavoidable, unwavering truth. Our reward is waiting. Our debt has been paid. Remember, winning team in the end. He is patiently waiting for us, arms open wide, to enter into his gates and spend eternity in his presence. We just have to keep moving forward and seeking his face. And I got to tell you, I've got a kind of fake it till you make it concept going with this at all times. I mean, I hope I do a good job projecting confidence and patience here. Not so much because I want the outside world to think I have it all together, but more as an example to my kids and to the broken world we live in and to myself until I can live it in truth. There are times when squaring our shoulders, lifting our chin and saying, here I go, as we step out in faith is the actual key to walking in faith, whether we feel like it or not, whether we can see where it's taking us or not. Paul tells us in Ephesians that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Survival, and ultimately thriving, is tied to remembering this. The true basis of the struggle, the true enemy, the big picture version of the battle, and what real victory actually looks like. The enemy's goal is to infiltrate our hearts, to focus on the in this world you will have trouble portion of the statement. And he uses avenues of discontent, fear, insecurity, and anxiety to do so. Some days, this really gets me. And I spend an alarming amount of time wrestling with what I lack with what I don't have, with what God didn't equip me with, instead of focusing on all the blessings of my life. It makes me feel unbalanced, frazzled, worn down, and frustrated. It keeps me from the truth, held in bondage to the lies at hand. It keeps those echoes of why me and what about me bouncing around in my heart and my head until I remember to finish the phrase, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And listen, as he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Reminding me that he knows exactly how scary this can be and doesn't expect me to react otherwise. It's so hard. It's so exhausting, this fight, this walk. And on the days we don't see results, which often seems like most days, it feels futile. And yet, and yet, it's the call. It's the purpose. 
to shine with the light of Jesus in a way that a broken world can't help but see it, even when our circumstances change, even when the world feels more broken than usual. My kids need to see me do this. The people in my life need to see me do this. The world needs to see us do this every day without ceasing, without hesitation, on our best days and on our worst days. They have to know it's possible to walk the walk no matter what, that it can be done because it is being done by regular people who are just all in. It's all about perspective and God-centered focus. And I'm just going to keep banging my head against that one until it sticks, until it changes the emphasis of my questions from, what about me, to, what about me? What about me gives me the right to complain? What about me should exempt me from the trials of humanity? What about me makes me the girl for the job? What about me has been created for such a time as this? What about me gets to play a part in this story? These are the questions that are productive, that lead to the rest of the narrative. Trust me, the results when we do this are always extraordinary. They're just not always expected. It won't be neat and tidy, but you will be more settled than you have ever been. It may not be pretty, but you will be absolutely beautiful. It probably won't be popular, but you will be so secure and rooted that the opinions of others will have a minimum impact on your heart and self-worth. Remember, he always does more than we could ever ask for or imagine. And he often asks for more than we think we can give which gets scary at times because it doesn't feel safe. We argue a little bit. We say, don't make me go there. I'm uncomfortable. I don't think it's safe. And to those of you who are saying this right now, you are echoing the words I speak all the time. And so to you, with the most tender honesty I can muster, I say this. Who said you get to be safe? God never promises our safety or our comfort. What he promises is our belonging and our salvation. That's why in the seasons and times that we're dragging our feet or we're kicking and screaming or we rail against our destiny, our circumstances, he waits patiently for us to quiet down. And then he says, sweet child, I know. I'm aware. And I'm still telling you to do it anyway. Because when you fuss at me that you're not safe, I'm going to remind you that I never told you you would be. I said you'd be saved. It's a V, not an F. I never said you'd stay safe. This is where the faith and the hope have to come in. In Romans 5.5, 5, Paul tells us, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's the waiting and the belief that his power will sustain us that knock us in the head, that chafes and rubs in all of our raw places, that doesn't sit well with our need for control or guarantees or instant gratification. It's the ability to hang on to hope in the face of the overwhelming and in the everyday that sustains us once we find it, yet eludes us more often than not. It's the peace that surpasses all understanding we need so desperately yet can't comprehend. It's those who wait on the Lord, who hope in the Lord, who soar on wings like eagles. This is easier said than done, I know. I got to tell you, my faith has definitely been under fire this year. It's not been my favorite year. And it's brought my faith really harshly under fire. 
Not so much in ways that make me doubt God's power or even his goodness, mostly. More in ways that have made me fear his plan and dread the possible paths. More fear of the pain of where he may take us and of the lessons we're supposed to learn. Because I got to tell you, I'm at the top of the list of people who want to feel safe, not just saved. And so it starts me spiraling down all those questions we mentioned and adding in questions like, what if we aren't strong enough for this? What if it hurts too bad? What if I'm not ready? My uncertainty has gotten the best of me more times than I care to confess. And my courage has been nothing to brag about, which may actually be the point, or at least part of it. You see, my part isn't what I need to be bragging about. I'm a tiny part of the plan, remember? Not the whole plan. And when I back up out of the way, weaknesses and all, God's power shines through. When what he wills is accomplished in spite of the fact that I am not very good at following directions or not very brave or not shining as brightly as I should have been, people see him. It's all for his glory, remember? That's the point. It's all his plan from beginning to end. Every single bit of it. And if I truly believe this, if I truly believe that God is the creator and the father, and I do, if I know his promises are true, and I do, this trumps everything. He is God. He is good at being God. He never wavers from being God. And in all that, he says, I have access to him, to his unending love and limitless power, that he knows my name, that he sees my fear and hurt and circumstances. And he's holding me in the shadow of his wings, carrying me through the worst of it, making sure I make it to the best he's got for me. What can stand against that? Who can separate us from it? The answer is nothing and no one. My hope is built on nothing less, and neither is yours. You see, friends, courage is not the absence of fear. It's moving forward in spite of it. It's knowing that faith is stronger, and that doesn't change with our changing circumstances. We do his work anywhere, anytime, any place, no matter what. The call doesn't change. We are courageous, we are called, and we are his forever. Would you pray with me? Most amazing God, once again we come to you and we thank you so much for being good at being God. We thank you that you are always God in every circumstance and that you are not aware of our human frailty you are not aware of the broken places of our fragile hearts. God, we thank you so much for these truths and all the other truths that come from you. We ask, Father, that you please give us strength, courage, drive, and passion to do the works you prepared in advance for us to do, to use everything you've given us for your kingdom and your glory, and to live lives that are fully for you, Help us to be still, Father, and to hear you all the other, over all the other noise and voices. Help us to understand that hard seasons don't last forever and that you are still there. Help us to remember that change can be scary and uncomfortable and you are still there. Help us to know that you see every single tear we cry and celebrate every single one of our wins. Let us live lives of joy and purpose regardless of our circumstances. And let us shine with that joy and purpose to the rest of the world in a way that is unmistakable, that is unforgettable, that is undeniable. Help us to love fiercely, looking out for each other without hesitation. Help us to have grace for those who may not agree with us. 
Help us to have grace for those who are struggling through their own fears, even when they cut us with their jagged edges. God, help us to take the truths we've learned over these last four sessions, to cling to them and to let them give us strength, to let them help us soar to the heights that you've called us to. Thank you, Father, for every amazing bit of this life in which we are totally yours. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this retreat. I hope that you have enjoyed yourselves as much as I have. I hope that you have learned some new things and found uh, some new places of courage. I want you to know that um, you are well prayed over by our entire team. We have prayed for everyone that will ever see this message, that you know the light and the truth of it, and you take it with you every day into every place. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us.